first three rings are to bring your body, speech, and mind together for these practices. These other rings are for the stages of the practice, and finally the last three rings are to bring your body, speech, and mind into a state of compassion, power, and insight. That's compassion. <laughs> which is very useful. And insight, which means to know your own mind. Some temples have huge columns outside and they call all the monks and nuns if it's a monastery or the town the people come. Here we're secluded, defined. Good evening, my name is Lama Tashi. This is Kwai Dharma Healing Center on the island of Kwai. We present this program Monday night, Thursday night, 6 to 8, every week. And the purpose of the practice is to show the shamanistic tradition of Tibetan Buddhism with all the various methods and um, what we call meditations or yoga. They actually fall into three categories. And um, these three categories come from a lineage that goes back thousands of years. So it's not new age. And how are they were how they pass on this tradition and how they practice it then is how we do it now. So because human nature doesn't change, the practices are to treat the human nature. So the practices don't change. But the three categories of Tibetan shamanistic Lamaism, which is what it's called in the in our tradition is sutra, which means a, a method of practice to convert the mind from always involving itself emotionally with what it's sensing and thinking. And that attracts a certain level of accomplished or spiritual human being. And what it does, or what it's designed to do, is deliberately and slowly let you adjust to your own true nature. And it does it by overcoming tendencies that you've acquired through many lifetimes, which are harmful. So that's the sutra, and it requires a lot of um, what we call oral instruction by the Lama. It requires empowerment and it requires somebody to have um, not only the ability but leisure time and some kind of support so that you can accomplish what these practices are intended to do. And the key word here is practice. In our lineage, the Kagyu lineage, which is very prolific, it's called the practice lineage. So what we stress is that you can hear these teachings, you can receive the blessings of the transmission, but unless you do the practice, there, there's no benefit. There's no development for yourself or others. And the sutra tradition is called Mahayana. Maha means great, yana means vehicle. But what that implies is that it has two foundations. One is a learned um, quality called unconditional love, which is not in our society, not in our world. <laughs> well, at least it's not obviously normal. But actually it's 
It is if you think of the mother's relationship to the children, whether the mother be human or animal. They have kind of an unconditional relationship that they want the children to survive and mature and so forth, be healthy. So that's Mahayana. And it's more about overcoming these tendencies. And it works. But in the process, it brings one to realize your inner intrinsic state of, of what we call insight or wisdom or intuitiveness. And it brings that out. It brings out a lot of other qualities that are latent in the human condition also, individually and collectively. So each person develops at their own speed and according to their own spiritual karma. The other level of practice in Tibetan Buddhism, which is not so prevalent, is called the Tantra. Now Tantra is Mahayana, but we take the practices of the Mahayana, loving kindness, compassion, insight, and so forth, and we move them into um, a more direct process. It's still mind training, but this direct process, instead of having to overcome or block, we actually use these tendencies, these, these emotional preoccupations with what we think and what we sense as the practice. So that requires a little higher spiritual karma. Well, not, not as many people can practice Tantra as the Mahayana. And if you go to other Dharma centers, most of them, they're, they're showing you Mahayana, very little Tantra. So we do both. But these classes are structured more for the Tantra. And the Tantra simply means wherever, whatever you are, wherever, whatever you're doing, whatever situation you're in, that's useful. So you don't have to really think about blocking this and overcoming that and, and uh, having extreme discipline or practicing austerities or any of that. But you still have to practice. So the way we structured this class is to give you a little taste of both. The emphasis is on the Tantra tradition and it's called the oral transmission of oral tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, and it's unique. All the other forms of Buddhism are religion, Theravada Buddhism and so forth. But this, this tradition that came out of Tibet and India is, is not really a religion. In fact, I vow never to go to heaven. So that takes the religion context right out of it. And I don't consider anything supreme or supernatural. And except for some of my previous girlfriends, I don't adore anything. <laughs> but still, you have to be human. You have to be kind and considerate. And more natural is the best term, natural. And actually, your true state of insight or wisdom is natural mind. And if you think of the natural world and how it really operates scientifically and so forth, your natural mind is, is exactly that. So the more natural you become inside, the more harm, harmonious you are with the outside world, nature itself. And once that finalizes through practice, there's nothing more to do. <laughs> there's nothing to accomplish in the human condition beyond that. We use the word Buddha, but Buddha simply means a mature man or woman, human being. That's it. And this state of maturity is that you, with your situation, are totally in harmony with the universe and every living being in the universe. And so the only appropriate word for all of that is 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the explanation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now getting back to who and what we are. I'm going to put this into our situation just as we are. As human beings, we're here to not only find out our true nature and mature, but we're also here to cherish others. And this cherishing, has, has again, as these two high qualities, unconditional love and altruistic, impartially applied compassion. Now these are learned qualities. Everybody says, oh, I have love, I have compassion. But that's worldly. These other two qualities are developed through practice from your own innate true state, which is a state of maturity, which is what these statues symbolize. This one behind me, Buddha. But cherishing others is all the sutras practice is only for others. <laughs> so you want to get away from the idea that it's for you. And how you do that is you must start understand that everything and everyone is interconnected to you. There's no such thing as separation which is what that Buddhist statue symbolizes. A state of complete unity. And that's the way the universe functions on every level, scientifically, spiritually, socially, however. So if you get that idea, then it's easy for you to do these practices and think all of it is going out to all the animals, humans, and spirits. Not just here, but everywhere. And that's called unconditional love. And then the manner of doing that, presenting that, is called altruistically, imp impartially applied compassion. So unconditional love and, and this altruistic compassion are, again, is inseparable. But you have to learn them. The reason you have to learn them because you're not doing that now. You go into relationships, for instance, the relationship is based totally on conditions. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. <laughs> I give you love, you give love back, whatever. So condition. But you, you want to train the mind to think more unconditional. How would it be? and then start to put that into your relationships, your relationships with each other, relationships with nature. And then we have this, this judgment problem. And it's based on the idea of separation. So we have something out here that you think is separate. So you judge it. Oh, that's good, that's bad, and I don't care about the rest. Those are the three categories. So if you say, that's good. Immediately an emotional response comes up. Attachment. Well, that's good, I want it. <laughs> if you say that's bad, then an emotional response comes up. Oh, I don't like that. Aversion. That distorts completely the situation. That judgment. And it, it gets a lot worse than that. I'm just simplifying where it starts. It actually evolves into thousands and thousands of these emotional, unstable factors of the mind. But if, if you recognize that. So more and more with, the, with your mindful practice, you start to remove that negative judgment call. And it gets easier and easier to do when you start to accept that everything is totally inseparable, integrated. And if you think that this is all united, 
and everything is that way, in your mind you've created an energy field of a Buddha. Just doing that. That's how simple it is to become mature. You hear, then you practice, and then you realize, oh, what the Lama said is workable. It's true. So I like to explain this at the start of practice because it's important. It's very important. And then all the other qualities, positive qualities of worldly involvement and all the positive qualities of your wisdom mind evolve naturally. They just start to come out. It's really cool. And I'm not take, speaking from hearing all my other teachers say this over and over and over. I'm saying it for my own having practiced since 1977 till today. And everything from that day to this day increased nicely. That doesn't mean I didn't have two steps forward and one back kind of program. <laughs> but Gradually, 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 less and less, junk, I, I like to say, distractions to who and what you really are. And so today, we have this hearing center, we have the, everybody connecting. And so tonight we're going to start the practice with what is called the lineage prayer which helps to put some of this in perspective. Now our lineage is one of five lineages of Tibetan Buddhism, but all the lineages are integrated. It's just that ours is so prolific, like all of the Dharma centers in Hawaii are what we call the Kagyu lineage, which was started in the 70s. So that shows the energy. I have to have this light So I can read this <laughs> without glasses. So we start with the first term, pre-mortal Buddha Vajradhara. That is actually your own intrinsic natural mind. And then all these other names that we're going to call, call are lineage holders. And the reason we say this is to bring them into this session because that's what they do. They're kind of out there in a timeless way. Lord Buddha Shakyamuni, Exalted Nagarjuna, Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava, Bliss Queen Yeshe Soiga, Lord Maitripa, Mahasiddha Varupa, Wisdom Dakini Sukhasiddhi, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Madropa, Venerable Milarepa, the Rainbow Body Nagumba, Kyumpo Naljur, Machik Klapki Roma, Glorious Kampopa, Mochakpa, Mahasiddhi Kirgampa, Sanjay Nantempa, Tai Sutu Rinpoche, Karma Norbu Lodro Taye, Omniscient Karmapa, Wondrous Kala Rinpoche, Lama Tenzin, Lama Santin, Lama Karmarinchen, and the benefactor today here now, Tashi Dundra. We supplicate to this direct lineage of lamas, of the Kagyu masters, of this profound path of Mahamudra. I pray that in following your lineage, grant me your blessing so that I may achieve perfect liberation. Revulsion is the foot of meditation. It is taught that the meditator who is not attached to food or wealth will cut the ties of this life. Grant your blessings so that I have no desire for honor or gain. Devotion is the head of meditation. It is taught that the Lama opens the gate to the treasury of oral instruction. To the meditator who continually supplicates the Lama, grant your blessings so that genuine devotion is born in me. Awareness is the body of meditation. As is taught, whatever arises in mind is fresh the essence of realization. 
To this meditator who rests simply without altering it, grant your blessings so that my meditation is free from, from conceptual distraction. The essence of thoughts is Dharmakaya. It is taught that it is nothing whatsoever, but everything arises from it. To the meditator who arises in the unceasing play, grant your blessings so that I realize the inseparability of samsara and nirvana. You embody the gross and subtle channels as the dakas and dakini. All the root and lineage lamas, as well as the three jewels, Karmapa, Kalaripashe, Lama, Tasha, Jungrup, and so forth, I implore you to bestow upon me the wisdom of bliss and voidness. Throughout all my births, may I not be separated from the perfect Lama, and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma. Perfecting the virtues of the paths and bhumis, may I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara, complete maturity. I have that, yeah, complete maturity. I had a few things. So this lineage prayer actually um, is incorporated in the sutra as part of the sutra practice. But in Tantra we do it to bring the lineage masters who we've just named into the present, just as I, Lama Tachi, are in your present. Now, of course, through the web, I'm illusory, more two-dimensional. But here, I'm still illusory, but three-dimensional. So, like that, all the lamas come into your practice. And when you do the refuge, you connect not only to these lineage lamas, but you connect to all the teachers, men and women, who are on the planet today in this tradition. So we start with the lineage prayer, which is on this page, and it's in Canadian and Sanskrit. So I'm going to read it, the opening prayer, which has to do with unconditional love and altruistic compassion. It says, we, we read this together in English. In order to attain enlightenment for ourselves, ourselves and limitless sentient beings, beings our, our mothers, we now, we now all together take refuge and offer prostration. I'm going to chant that in Sanskrit so that the spirit understand what's going on. Dagdan Gruva Nanke Dadan Yampe Sam Sam Tam Se Dudi Ne Shunte GC Jang Shu Ningpo La Chi Ki Bardu. Then we chant the refuge prayer. That's attached to each source of refuge. It means we go for refuge. And the word we mean, implies that you and all the beings in the universe together. Then we say this in American. We go for refuge to all the glorious holy lamas. We go for refuge to all the idams or the deities gathered in Amandala. We go for refuge to all the Buddhas, those who have conquered the mind and gone beyond. We go for refuge to all the Supreme Dharma. We go for refuge to all the Noble Sangha. We go for refuge to all Dakas and Dakinis, who are the protectors and defenders of the Dharma. All of these possess the eye of transcending awareness. To the Buddha, Dharma, and this Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until enlightenment. May I do very gain from practicing the six perfections, 
accomplish Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. And that last phrase is the, is the prayer of a bodhisattva, and it's called bodhicitta, mind of a bodhisattva. We're going to chant that in Sanskrit. Sanjay Jo Dan Jo Ki Jo Dan La Jai Jo Gardu Gardi Jai Jo Ji Gardi Jai Jo Ji Pe Jo Dan Ji Jo Dan Jai Sanjay Jo Parso. Now, refuge prayer and the Bodhicitta prayer are chanted or said three times before formal practice. All of the Tibetan Buddhist Dharma centers do these two prayers at the start of practice. So wherever you go, whatever lineage Dharma center you find, here or anywhere on the planet, this is the basis. This is incorporated into all the practice. And most of them will do a lineage prayer similar to the one that we just did. Now in practice, it's about your mind. It's about the mind. The reason I use the word the rather than your is because you're really not your mind. Okay? A thousand lifetimes you've been giving it power and saying it's who you are. And that's led to an unhealthy situation. And it's global. So don't feel like the Lone Ranger. Because 7.5 billion humans think that what they think and what they sense is who they are. And relatively that's true. Why? Because you believe that. The belief is the cause of great suffering on this planet. It's belief. Yeah. It actually, it's the basis of lots of social structure like religions and politics and corporation, military, and so forth. Belief. But how do you how do you take on the mind without identifying with it as who you are? <laughs> so in meditation, what we develop are two states of peace that exist in this mind. And we use that as the basis to move beyond the confines of the I, me, mind, this restricting what we call selfish inclination or ego, egocentric, egocentric. So to do that, you have to understand that the first necessity is to be able to focus. Okay? It's called meditation. But in focusing, you have to be able to use the structure of your mental process called the imagination. Now, some people have really powerful imaginations, and yet some have none, no imagination, none whatsoever. In fact, in our social structure today, because of all of the cell phones, TVs, computers, and so forth, the children are developing without the ability to use that function. And it's become a big problem worldwide, especially in Western countries. But back to the two, the function. So being able to focus, you also want to be able to use the mental process of making pictures, imagine. Why? Because they can construct symbols that help you to understand what you're doing and help to keep you focused at the same time. So the first kind of meditation that is taught, and especially in America where we have the Hindu practice of 
um, corporate hatha yoga, I like to call it. Everywhere he held that. Is to be peaceful, to relax, but at the same time be able to use your body, certain posture and so forth. So the original purpose of of yoga or meditation was to be, be come into a state of peace and tranquility. Now that <laughs> that for most people is hard, almost impossible. Why? Right, because the mind's running. And if you say to a person, "Stop thinking," you, you can't do. It. <laughs> You go to sleep, you're still thinking. You're dreaming, you're still thinking. You're dying, you're still thinking. You leave the body, you're still thinking. See? You're given a great power. So you teach the first type of practice to attain a state of peace. Called, and we call it shine, or in Sanskrit, India, they call it samatha. But it simply means to locate in yourself a place of still like a pond. You throw a stone in the pond, lots of ripples. But eventually the ripples you can see into the pond. <clears throat> well that seeing into the pond is, is the second stage of meditation. And it is called Vipassana. We say in Tibetan, Shine, in Sanskrit, Samatha. Vipassana means insight. So now you've calmed your pond, your mind, and then you use your focus and your imagination to see into it. And there's specific oral instruction for doing that. Because when you can see into your mind, you not only see all of the thoughts, emotional program and the tendencies, but you also locate a place of um, clear light, clarity, which is way more useful than the peace, but you have to get to the peace stage before you get to clarity. So Shine and Latong is called in Japan. Shine, acquire a state of peace, Latong. So before we do any real meditation practice, I like to teach backwards. Give a person a college degree and then let them get to high school and grade school later. <laughs> Kindergarten. Kindergarten. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is how this is how you it's good to know where you're going also, you know. Like I developed a habit of reading books and I always went to the last chapter and then read the book. Or give away the plot in the movie. Who people hate that. <laughs> so this is kind of weird. <laughs> so, in Vipassana, or inside meditation, which is commonly called wisdom, the lamas, the teachers, over all these years, have been then what they call pointing out. Now each Lama has his own methods, her, her methods, and also they adopt certain phrases for teaching the students this clear pond thing, this see into it, see the inside. So it says, this is a, a Lama Namsa said this, the varieties of appearances that we experience are simply the magical display of mind. And notice he didn't say your mind or our mind. Mind cannot be shown by saying this is it. Thus, mm -hmm. samsara and nirvana are free from the root of judgment. Mm -hmm. Recognizing this to be the all-pervasive nature of the universe 
and your mind is called insight. So without meditating, just sit with your back straight and your eyes open, because right here in front of you is nature without any picture. And I'll read this again, and then we'll just relax and allow that energy to move you from your head, the monkey mind, whatever you want to call this thinking thing, to the heart. And the heart is the symbol of maturity. So this Lama Namsal said, all the varieties of appearances are simply the magical display of one's mind. Mind cannot be shown or said that this is it. Thus, all of samsara, which is our emotional state, and all nirvana, which is the peace state, are free from a root cause. Recognizing this to be the dharmakaya, dharma, dharma means insight, kaya means vehicle, is like space. So you just sit with your back straight and your eyes open because the space is right in front of your eyes. And be present. Use your awareness to be present. And take these words to heart. Now when you practice like this without support, the words disappear, but the energy of the words remain echoing in your situation. By being peaceful and present, they naturally get you in the heart, heart mind. Let's try another one. This was Mama Drumpa. He said, psychic existence and peace are equal. And in that way, they are free from elaboration. To make effort, how very exhausting. Body and mind are non-dual, not separate, and at the same time transparent. To hold them to be different, how very afflicting. Self and others are non-dual. Everything interconnected within the state of the Dharmakaya, which is all pervasive, the all-pervasive vehicle. To take them as a judgment of good or bad, how very pitiful. <laughs> so you just sit. Be present and aware. And you keep these, this type of meditation, this type of I call it contemplation to short sessions, one or two minutes. Because what you are doing here is the last chapter of this book. <laughs> <laughs> Which is how the definitive meaning of everything. But at the same time, you're accomplishing a state of peacefulness and looking into your true nature by these words, like looking into a 
Boom, boom. The Lama Lady Nimba Rigpa proclaimed, Looking at the body, non-arising is seen. Looking at the mind, freedom from elaboration is seen. This non-dual nature is beyond the conceptual mind. Therefore, I know nothing at all. The Indian scholar Maitripa explained as the nature of mind that all phenomena are empty of any essence of their own. And the mind that conceives of this emptiness becomes pure in its own place. Being free from conceptual mind without mental activity is the path and realization of all mature human beings called Buddha. And one more. Lama Sarpa continued with this pointing out, said, mind left just as it is, is the all-pervasive nature like space. Thoughts created by the intellect are liberated in their own place. So practice this inconceivable point without effort. This book was written by the Third Karmapa, which is about 700 years ago, when writing started to take place, and translated by the Ninth Karmapa, and it's called Maha Mudra. Maha means great, Mudra means position or view. And this ocean of definity meaning means how do you relate to this complicated structural, constantly conceptual or conceiving state called mind. How do you, how do you get a handle on that? So from page one up to what I just read is how to practice all of that. But that, that's a <laughs> pretty way. So we're going to make it a little bit easier. What we have to train or discipline 
is a body with a name and a place. And action, which we call what we do with the body. And then speech, how we relate with our body to others. And then the mind. Now the mind is the boss of these first two, the body and the speech. Some people think by simply training their speech with mantra and all kinds of powerful phrases and so forth, they can cop, become mature. And actually some traditions put a lot of effort in that. But without training the mind, it can't happen. Same with the body and activity. People think that with certain body programming called Hatha Yoga, or we have one we call Yantra Yoga and so forth, that you can become mature. Unless you train the mind, cannot. Now in training the mind, there's only one tradition. And that tradition is based on the human qualities, as I said before, loving kindness and compassion. Like the mother, relationship to the children, disciplining and training the children so that they can survive, grow up, become accomplished, and so forth. So the body, is the speech, are the servants of the mind. Understanding that, we do the first step in, to, in practice to bring these three together. Now I'm going to show you a symbol. <laughs> some, some kid gave me these marbles. <laughs> but when we train the body and the mind, we want to bring them together in the same place. So in our practice, we start with the breath, and it's called the three lights prana yoga breathing practice. And we use the focus of your awareness and your imagination so that you imagine the air that you're inhaling is white light. It's a sphere. It's a sphere of energy. And it contains all the elements. It's elements, there's five elements inseparable. So all of them in your air. The second thing you do is you have a middle breath that extracts the energy of the air you breathe and passes it through your body. That's a spontaneous program of staying alive. So that one we, we quickly imagine red light as that energy passing quickly through the body. The third thing that we imagine is that these two have restructured a psychic energy because of this method of healing, so we're going to share that with others, so when you inhale the air out your nose, you think blue light. Now the reason you do that is because body, speech, and mind have come together with your focus and your imagination and are actually creating another situation that is not ordinary. And that is, you have brought your body, speech, and mind together in this three lights practice. There's more to it than this, but this is where we start. So we use this clear sphere, because by doing that, now you enter the state of peace, where you start to become clear, able to see into the arm, for instance. You sit with your back straight, eyes open, Soften your gaze to the space and light two feet in front of you. Hands in a comfortable position in your lap or on your knees. Head slightly tilted forward. And mouth closed, tongue resting against the towel. With the body structured in these five positions, you bring your focus, your awareness, to your breath. 
visualizing the air you're inhaling as white light, completely filling your lungs or this part of your body. With the middle breath, the absorption breath, imagine the energy that's spontaneously extracted passing through your body in a flash of red light. Very subtle psychic energy pattern. Then as you exhale out your nose, you visualize the blue light goes to space. Everybody, you make it available to everybody. Inhale white light, fill your lung. Red light energy absorbed through the body. Exhale the blue light to space. Space is easy to Visualize if you think of a clear blue sky. Now just this method of the three lights, Strana Yoga breathing technique, which is taught by all the traditions, all the lamas, will, with practice, will quickly bring you into this state of shine, peace and tranquility. And even if you have a runaway monkey mind, with practice, slowly and slowly, you detach and start to recognize this state of peace as useful. Formally in practice, of course, but more importantly, integrated into your lifestyle. Now one of the applications that we use for healing is to take the element of the air and structure it to what it really is, five elements. And these five elements make everything. Everything in the phenomenal world we call everything made of light. Because we have light matter and dark matter. And then we also have light energy and dark energy. So everything that you see, your sense, your body and everything are made of these five elements. And we're not the only tradition that uses this for healing. But this method of the bringing the body, speech and mind with the three lights meditation is our method to connect to the healing energy of those five elements. So we're going to do that. I'm going to use one of the five elements that are a symbol of light or heat or what we call radiation or fire. And it is symbolized in our tradition with the red pyramid, four-sided pyramid, like what's shaped like what the Egyptians made. Four side and a base. Okay. This symbol 
will psychically connect to the healing energy of all five elements, but predominantly through the radiation or fire, which is for us the warmth in the body, for instance or the healing energy of the sun. So now again, do the three lights breathing. Inhale, white light. You immediately pass the red light through your body, middle breath. And share the results of those two with blue light out your nose, filling space. Then collect the three lights together, like I showed you, and create a tiny sphere, a particle, right in the center of your chest. And when you do that, you connect it to the totality of space, referencing the particle as the energy of light. And as you know, particles are not stationary. They integrate into everything that you can sense or think about. So you start with that tiny particle in the center of your heart, creating a chakra. Then from that basis, with your imagination, you expand that particle into a tiny clear light sphere. And in that way you enter into our third dimensional phenomenal situation. Then keeping your focus and your imagination on that tiny sphere of clear light, keep expanding it until it assumes the form and shape of the red pyramid, four-sided pyramid, made of light. Label that fire, the element radiation and fire, heat. Keep the size about the size of the one I, symbol I showed you. And you should know that all five elements are incorporated in that one, and separately. Then with your imagination, have it move out in front of your chest and up before your eyes, about two feet in front. Keeping your focus and imagination together, expand it in size until it creates a large room with you sitting inside. Red in color, just like it looked when it's small. And feel the energy of the element penetrating your physical form as if you were in like a, a sun, you're sitting in the sun.
Then we start to apply this healing symbol to our neighborhood. So we imagine the symbol to grow in size until it completely encloses this island of Kwai or the town or city where you live. The same healing energy that you're applying to yourself, to everyone in that locale. Then you expand it in size to completely enclose Mother Earth, but including the atmosphere inside. The next step is to expand it in size to completely enclose our solar system with the sun in the middle and all the planets inside this red pyramid symbol of fire. Then expand it to completely enclose our dish-shaped spiral galaxy. And finally, allow it to merge with our phenomenal world which has no center or boundary. When you do this, you relax. Conceptual mind cannot entertain this concept. So you just allow your mind to be open and clear like space. If you see a reddish glow, it's okay. Then return from this non-conceptual state and again with your focus and imagination, visualize the red pyramid enclosing the galaxy. Then shrink it to just enclosing our solar system. and smaller and smaller to just enclosing Mother Earth. And smaller yet to just enclose your town or island where you live. Then collect all the energy of this practice into the red pyramid with you sitting inside. Your own personal son.
then bring it to its original small size two feet out in front of your eye. Bring it to chest level and into your heart chakra. Shrink it in size till it assumes a tiny sphere of clear light. And tinier and tinier to it assumes a particle similar to an atom. Then relax the same way you did when you entered the macrocosm. Just stay present, alert, but no meditation. Then bring your awareness to in front of your eyes and expand it into your place of practice. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all of the sutras, all of the tantric practices of Tibetan Buddhism follow this format. All of them. So when we use the term dharmakaya, like space, we say all pervasive nature, that's for you. But when you share that energy with these symbols like we just did, that's for everybody else. There's no such thing as separation. It doesn't matter your, your own personal situation as a, as a symbol of the microcosm how small things can get. <laughs> Microcosm, macrocosm, same cosm, same state of infinity. There's no boundaries there, no center, there's nothing to get your brainy little mind around. <laughs> so you get clear. That's looking into the pond. But what you really did here is you created a state of peace and tranquility, shine, by bringing the mind focus, or we say awareness, together with the imagination of the symbol in each stage. Now all five symbols of Tibetan Buddhism are used for healing in this way. And actually we create many energy forms called stupas, that people can go to and healing starts to take place. Holistic healing, not just physical, mental, emotional. Mm -hmm. Spiritual, spiritual just means to be natural in connection with natural mind and nature. So earth is used in this practice the same way as that fire element, it's a six-sided gold or yellow cube. Water, blue, sphere, just like our earth. Fire, when I mentioned, air is visualized as a half sphere of green light, like a bowl with a lid. And space, similar to the water element, is a white sphere. Now, why do we color code? Why do we symbolize? Because there's no other way to break the monkey mind. <laughs> you see? Now people get really good with these practices. But sometimes when they get really good with these practices, which go beyond, this is actually an ordinary application. The extraordinary practices are just that, extraordinary. 
but it's all for healing. But some people, when they get really good at this, the eye becomes inflated. They become arrogant. Oh, I, I can heal myself. I can heal anybody. Yeah. These qualities start to come out because they're practicing with their imagination. And they're learning to focus, which they never did before. <laughs> they're bringing the three together, which is the purpose of Sutra and Tantra, the body, speech, and mind into a straight of clear light, clarity, so that you know what you're doing, how to apply it, without becoming attached to the process. Because attachment is another emotional dysfunction. And when you said things are good, but don't say this is good. <laughs> it just is what it is. Any questions? Was that fun? Um, <laughs> <I'm rainbow>. <laughs> <laughs> I might explain to you that when you enter the microcosm and the macrocosm, those are similar to the experience of insight, the tom or the vipassana, similar. But because you're using conceptual mind and a meditation technique to move into that, it's not the same. Okay. But it gives you a taste. It gives you a taste of peace, which you can take into your post-meditation daily experience and your involvement with others. Especially here in Hawaii, which is so nice to begin with. Marmoni. I mean, I get a weather report every day. Sunny with shower. 70 to 80 degrees. Every day. Tides, one to two feet. Big deal. <laughs> 12 hour days. Oh, good. Amazing. <laughs> but that's too easy for most people. Too soft. These five elements are structured in such a way that you they're used to healing in meridians, acupuncture, acupressure, herbology, all kinds of I've been using 20 different modalities to take care of a, of, a, of a, a slight inconvenience in my body. 20 different modalities, which were caused by medicine itself. Okay. So I'm using medicine to cure something that was caused by medicine. But <laughs> without going into that, what we're doing here is the cause of all disease, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, is the dysfunction of the emotional program of judgment. And what we want to do is cut it at the root, but at the same time do it in such a way that we, we get it. So your own mind just now was training your mind. All I'm doing, the Lama is giving you the method. It's kind of like software for the computer. You put it in, the three lights meditation is the password. The link is bringing the three together to that particle. That's going into your hard drive. Now your hard drive is storing all this stuff. So with your imagination, your focus, you key it in. So that is like the program. We call the software. So you did put it in your mind as a, like a computer. Then what comes up on your screen is what you're imagining. And you need color and you need shape. And that's called meditation. When you don't do any of that, where you just have a blank screen and you're locating that as useful, that's called contemplating. You're really not meditating. Like the first thing we did at class then, we read these words pointed out. Nothing whatsoever. <laughs> the true state. But it isn't nothing. 
It's actually the totality of everything giving you infinite possibilities. That's what they call quantum physics. But then what comes up on your screen is what's the token. That's the purpose. So these five elements are color coded. But remember when I started the class, I said everything is integrated, not separate. These five elements, that color code is to open up five states of useful intrinsic awareness that are in your mind. It already, all sentient beings have them. The only difference between Buddha and ordinary beings is that Buddha is usually it and the ordinary beings are not. Okay? The mature human beings connecting, the rest are not. They're not interested or whatever. So we take this five color code and we apply it to the tendencies of the emotion. For instance, unity, the color blue. We give it a blue sphere. Similar to the water sphere. So what's happening with these five elements is since there's no separation, because of the code which has developed over thousands of years for the, us new homeo sapien minded human, your intrinsic states of awareness are activated. And you start to accept the state of unity more and more just the way you accept the water is used. Then air, you color code it, but it connects you to the state of how do you use this state of unity? Well, we just kind of did it with the three lights elemental practice. How about space itself? This comes from this state of clear light is the nature of space. Space can't be defined. It really is not earth, water, fire, or air, but it's all of those appearance things. Earth. The earth element connects you to a state of equality. Be no high, no low. Emotionally, it means a state of equanimity, where you start to learn that everything is the same. If you've learned everything's the same, you can't judge anything. Get it? No good or bad. If you don't have good or bad, high and low, you don't have arrogance. Arrogance, right. And then finally, fire itself is the discerning quality of your mind that says this is healthy, this is not. This is useful, this is not appropriate. See? But more importantly, you start to discern the clear light nature as the nature that's all pervasive in everything. And it's not God. And God isn't your kind. <laughs> not divine and supernatural, none of that. And these are useful states of awareness that you can involve yourself with anything, business, relationship, gardening, I use this in gardening. These five elements of the nature of everything that's in your garden, for instance. How do you use that in gardening? Awareness. These are five states that's, of awareness. Specifically. Specifically. I know that if I put this seed in the ground, the ground has to, I'm aware that the ground has to have a certain quality. Okay? It can't be hard packed like our Hawaiian soil. Mm -hmm. It needs nutrient, okay, and water, and so forth. So I'm going to put this seed in nice, loamy ground okay, that I've been working and developing. Then I'm aware that it's going to need air, oxygen. So I do things that, that cause the oxygen to get to the roots of those plants, which is prevalent here in Hawaii with what we call lava, black rock, cinder. In the volcano. Then at the, the light, the space, you got to give your plants room. If you don't want them bunched up too close together, you get, depending on the plant, you got to be aware of how it's going to be. Then the earth 
and the fire is the sun. So you're aware of these qualities until you locate your plant according to the conditions of the sunlight, the availability of water, the nature of the soil. But more importantly, the spirits that are in the earth, water, fire, air. And you start to invoke these spirits. Come, help me grow my garden. Now the Finhorn Garden, Peter Caddy's program in Scotland, was one of the most powerful demonstrations of how spirit energy is useful. Because he did it in a place where you couldn't grow anything. <laughs> and he had three goddesses, three women, meditating, connecting to the spirits. The spirits gave him the information. The three girls gave it to Peter Caddy, and they all went to work and created the Finhorn Garden. That's my experience. So now we're, we've crossed over into the stadium. How is this useful spirituality? Because these spirits inhabit your body. Oh. Just like animals. Parasite. So here's how to do the second stage of time. Three lights. Meditation. You start the same way. Now we're going to move from the ordinary application, which I call the worldly application of the three lights, to the extraordinary application of psychic energy to deal with the spirit world, the human, and the animal condition, which are all the same. And we're going to use three sounds based on Sanskrit. This is the Tibetan Om's sound, how it looked. Okay, it looks like a 31 with a V and a da over here. Then the A ah sound, red light, looks like a 31, no V and da over here. Then the Hoon looks like a tilted letter 5 with a dot and a couple of hooks under it. Now these are actually Sanskrit letters, but these are from a dimension of a consciousness that has to do with awareness, this side, going to connect to the five elements, or going the other way. When you do this, you attach these three sounds to the three lights of your breathing goes like this. Same posture, back straight, head tilted, eyes open, mouth closed, hands comfortable. Inhale, white light. Hear the sound OM. So you've practiced the three lights meditation so well that now you see the light filling your lungs and you hear the sound OM at the same time. Then the Radiation of the red light, the energy permeating your body, the middle breath, you hear the sound, ah. With that flash of red light energy, ah. And then the blue light out your nose to fill space, the healing sound is hum. In Tibetan, H-U-M or H-U-N-G, hum. You don't really have to see it with these three, this code, but it's helpful. Inhale white light, om, here om. Energy of the elements through your body, red light, om. These combined exhale the healing energy to space, blue light, out your nose, om, here the om.
And the next step in this tantric practice is to bring the three together like you did before. So the three codes, white, red, and blue, and the three sounds, om, on, whom, all at once become a particle in the center of your heart chakra. And at the same moment you do that, of course, you take your focus off the breath. And starting with this symbol of basic space, you increase that tiny particle to a tiny sphere of clear light. And visualize it now to become a five colored sphere of light. And inside that sphere, you see the sound OM. Now OM is O-M, or however you want to spell it, white color. But give it thickness so it's not two-dimensional. It's a vibratory energy pattern of clear light or clarity. It's the representation of space. Then that home in a five-colored sphere of light, you project it to all the lamas and all the symbols that the lamas use. They're called deities and protectors. And you visualize these lamas and their symbols around you in space. It's what you took refuge in. Called the three roots of Tantra. They accept the light offering emanating from your heart to all of them. And each and every one, like lasers, sends the energy back into the home in your heart. With the Om, you become the Buddha of clarity. So what this means is the all-pervasive nature like space becomes the nature of your mind. So you think that now you're this mature human entity. And the hands are held in this position. So you take your index finger and thumb and touch them together, extend the other three fingers, and place them like this. Either way is correct, in front of your heart chakra. And what you're doing is you're taking the earth and water of your human condition and sending the three roots power and the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha's power everywhere. Now this is the symbol of this poem as an actual Buddha, viral karma. So you pick, visualize yourself white in color, wearing the robes of a llama or clothes, and sitting on a sun and moon disk and a lotus, but in space. And then in that space, you visualize Beautiful natural setting like quiet, ocean, mountains, waterfall, animals, rainbows, everything, however you like. And as soon as you get that detail, you as this illusory body, as this llama with this hand position, You think that this healing energy goes to everybody. Every animal in the ocean and on the land, all the 7.5 billion humans, all the spirits pervading space.
inseparable. They're all in this beautiful natural projection. And this causes the mantra to appear. The mantra of clarity. The mantra of knowing. Knowledge. Om Vairo Karna Vam Om Soha Om Vairo Karna Vam Om Soha So you say that mantra and you see it in your heart around the Om sign. Well, the heart representation of this creation this mandala you're creating, which everybody's in this mandala. Om Vairo Kana, Vam Om Soha. 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 Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha. Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha. Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha. Now the tantric practice is bring the Vam, which is the symbol of space, together with the sound Ah, Om. This Om. And this Vam merging, which means all the natural world that you are visualizing, just how you like it, is the Vam. And the Om is the clarity of your mind as healing energy for everybody in your projection. That's it. We have five Buddhas up there. The central one is the one we're doing. Okay. But that Buddha with his hand position and it being white colored is this natural world with a mature human being, including everybody in its goodness. That's you. That's it. Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha 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 so I mean, always increasing. No one left out. Unconditional love, altruistic compassion is the nature of everybody. Everything. Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha Om Vairo Kana Vam Om Soha if you want to think that this is an antidote, it's okay. But what it is an antidote to is ignorance, stupidity, bewilderment, delusion. I could go on and on. Clarity is not knowing, antidote to not knowing. So this knowledge, this insight, this wisdom state is your inherent state. This is the application that whatever is appropriate will arise in your stream of being. 
Take your two hands and assume the hand mudra of this Buddha, white in color. Male aspect means it's all about method, imagination, and focus to attain clarity and knowledge. And the consort of this Lama is the Dakini of space. Everything is appearing in space. And you take your meditation like a painter, great detail. So how do you look as this Buddha? Eyes, clothing, position, hand, color. How does this look in your heart chakra, with the five colored sphere, the mantra, and the sea cell of the horn? How does it look out here, like paradise, and everybody's in it? <laughs> We're all at the beach. Arises in clear light, long in the, in the state of space. It's the long, om, applied as wisdom or knowledge. So on, always increasing to the benefit of everybody, impartially applied, all animals, humans, and spirits. And the entire universe are in your projection. And it fills your mind. Now that's the creation stage of Tantra practice. The tantric practice has two stages. You create in your mind your Buddha field, your energy field. Apply it to everybody and everything. Using a specific quality of clear light or clear thinking, knowledge, knowing. Then you disappear it. So all of the field around you, all the natural world, all the beings, come into you as this symbol of Vairokana Buddha. Then you disappear your illusory light body as this Buddha 
into the mantra, which is circling the home sign in your heart. Then you disappear the mantra, those syllables, into the home, which is the all pervasive state of clear light we call the Dharmakaya. Now there's no meditation, no concept, no judgment. Like space, you can relax. The trick is, with practice, is to be totally present in the moment. and mindful. Treat everything that arises, emotions, thoughts, tendencies, physical sensations, all of that as clear light. Thoughts arise, the essence is life. Sounds arise, same. Emotional tendencies, just like the thought, disappear. If you get this, everything that you meet in your daily life, this is how you meet it. Whatever arises, this nature is voidness. Sentient beings not knowing this, great compassion for them arising without being arrogant. Then when you come out of this state of relaxed awareness, then you simply think of this natural world as what you are entertaining with this practice. Well, here in Hawaii it's easy. But what if you live in downtown New York? Or LA. Well, that's good because then you have to practice more. <laughs> Adverse situations actually are the best reason to do these mindful practices. But to explain what we just did, this is highest tantric yoga. One Buddha field, five Buddha field. This one dealt with the mind's energy of thought, emotion, tendencies, as being clear of any construct, as something actually existing. 
And this is true. If you scientifically ask it, what is coming into your mind when you see something through your eyes? What is? Is the object you're looking at coming in? No. The energy of it, a picture of it is, through your eye faculty. And that is transported to your meaty little brain. And that picture appears in your brain in a certain place. And the color code of all of that causes the brain to do things to your body. Now, if you judge what you saw as bad, <laughs> the hormonal influence for your body is very dense, toxic. You see? Even if you say it's good, you're distorting the picture. So another hormonal secretion. So you get this dense patterning out in your body. This happened to me through my karmic being aged. I'm 79, so I have this age karmic. So actually, I made a lot of improper decisions based on attachment. I wanted to get things over with quickly, so I took these medicines that accomplished that. They're called allopathic, but they were toxic. So they built up in my body the same way as the patterning of what you sense them. To such a state that it compromised my immune system. So now I can't do that anymore. I can't take the quick fix. So I have to go the slow way. Now I've got to get back to natural, naturopathic application. But I can still use my meditation to speed up the process. So what usually takes years to cure, to get a, get a result, according to being aged, <laughs> can now take place in a much shorter period of time. So I have to learn to relax, stay focused, here's my imagination. All of this is just wonderful. I am not my body, because this body is going, this is just a house for my consciousness. I keep that in mind too. Impermanent. Everything is impermanent. This is impermanent. It lasts a long time because it's plastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's Isn't it assuming that this is all wonderful and judgment? No. <laughs> You're causing say. the brain to secrete chemicals. You mean the wow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you'll get over that. <laughs> you have to start someplace. Like you take psychedelic drugs. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> so under the influence of the psychotropic drugs, you like created another realm entirely. But that other realm is just in, is this realm. You're seeing it in its true nature. Then the psychotropic drugs over your back to ordinary scene. Okay. Well, you got an idea of what really is going on, but is it useful? And what did it do to your body? Well, you're in La La Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same with extreme activity. People go into the zone because of the zone. Yeah. Sexual activity, a certain type. Near death experience. Oh, I saw the light. There's no light in your mind. Light's a concept. Colors are a concept. There's no black or white. There's no rainbow in mind. Mind is totally clear. That's viral kind of Buddha. That's what you were just practicing. But you colored it, didn't you? You colored the Buddha white and you had a nice hand position and wearing the robes of the Lama. You know, the Lamas don't usually dress like I'm a household of Lama, so I'm kind of weird. But most of the Lamas are monks and nuns, so they have that to take care of. But in any case, then around you, all this colorful waterfall, beating soldiers, mountains, birds, spirits, lovely human. <laughs> <laughs> just your mind. Because you apply to want everybody to be happy in that state. But most importantly, you don't want this happiness to go away. Happiness goes away. One day happy, next day sad. 
One moment you're wowing and the other moment you're ah, oh, I'll shoot myself. Devastated. <laughs> <laughs> I get a phone call. I'm devastated. Yeah. Do the three lights breath and call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to take three aspirins. Okay. <laughs> so, any questions? We have some time left. I'm kind of curious about Thursdays. Is that just kind of like an extension from tonight? Did no, there's no extension. <laughs> you got the you got the basis and the end. Now you have to fill in the middle. <laughs> so every class is structured more and more middle. Yeah. Yeah. But basically the three lights and those five elements and doing a deity yoga, which we use the Buddha tonight, which is highest deity. Bodhisattvas, these are bodhisattva symbols. See up here? These are all bodhisattva symbols. Those are mind training also. But they're used the same way we structured this practice we did tonight. There's five Buddha energy fields, but they're the, all the same. Mm -hmm. If you get unity, these five are all in this state. If you get this one, the other four are in this state. In whichever state of discerning awareness you're de developing, you can't. If you're going to you access all the Buddha energy fields. You're going to one, you got all the rest. Same with the elements. You get one element working, you got all the elements. That's why I'm healing so fast. Yes, I still have to think, do physical stuff. Of course. One of the things I have to do is lift weights and get my muscles done. <laughs> you can visualize that. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the gym, play with that. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah. Now, this short path, Tantra is short. Sutra takes takes the same place, but it takes longer. Actually, there's any on a path like Hinduism takes many thousand lifetimes. Okay, but eventually you start to know who you are. You know. Mahayana is like getting in a car going up faster. Tantra, helicopter, right to the top. Sure. Then there's one more practice where you don't need a vehicle. And these are vehicles. <laughs> and that's the one I read the first, at the start of class. You go directly to know that this is a illusion. This is a illusion. Everything you're sensing, everything you're thinking about. If you go in the past, the past doesn't exist. The illusion. But look at how much energy people use with past life or the past experience. Every day, oh, I wish I was young again. They do everything they can back to 16. What if they go to the future? The future hasn't happened yet. But here they spend all the time projecting, oh, I'm going to go here, I'm going to do this, like this. Next moment they're dead, where does that go? That's what the danger of the emotions is. If you have anger and you die in that state of anger, your future looks horrible. You don't get angry. <laughs> it's the most destructive of all the human emotional tendencies. It marks your mind in such a way that many lifetimes hard to get rid of. It makes your body go, oh, get, get your Adrenaline. And patience is the antidote. Patience and loving kindness. Mm. Loving kindness. Cherishing others. Never get angry. Never have, don't even say something's bad. Mm. You know, like we got these politicians. This country is divided and there's judgment called by the politicians. Eh, don't even bother. You have to have compassion for those poor human beings. That's a terrible lifestyle. Their future looks horrible. Their next life. May they be better than wrinkles. 
<laughs> oh, sorry, Raymond. Yeah, I mean, he's like, what's wrong with my life? <laughs> <laughs> he's not he's my guy. Yeah, he's not my <laughs> he got that one, did he? Oh, I'm so sorry. Next slide, beautiful woman. Okay, so now we're going to dedicate to Merrick, and when we do that. What about Lisa's father? When we do that. Okay. <laughs> now, what, what does it mean, Merrick? means. Merit means is a word like Boy Scouts in America. Merit means the accumulation of your virtuous activity that causes that kind of tendency to go forward in your future. So virtuous activity is what we're performing tonight with these practices. And it, it has, because of our application that we're including everybody, everything in the, in the app, then at the end of the practice session you dedicate the merit to to limit the sentient beings. You don't waste it. That means it's equally shared by all of these animals, humans, and spirits. But you can think of it like a huge, infinite triangle. And at the point of the triangle is some particular person that you cherish that's needing special energy. So Lisa's father said it's supposed to die tonight. Die means leave the body. There's no such thing as death. But in any case, we're dedicating the merit to that person. Then that person receiving this direct energy with, with being at the point, it spreads out automatically to all living beings. Because the mind in this state has no limit. What we did tonight, no limit. Unconditional love doesn't have a limit. Impartial compassion, no limit. That way it's not wasted. Like, you have a drop of water, you put it in the ocean, it becomes the water of the ocean. But just like that. So tonight we're dedicating this merit to Lisa's father, so that his passing is comfortable, and so that his mind streak enters into a favorable situation in his coming life. His name is Donald Phil Marcion, and he is located right now in Brandon, Florida. So we dedicate the merit of all our virtuous activity tonight to that individual. May his rebirth be favorable. May he be happy. All future lives appropriate. And then all sentient beings, all our grandmothers, mothers, fathers, everybody we know that's past, everybody that we know or have karma with that's present, we share this heartfelt, unconditional love. Then we say it an actual dedication prayer. Now there are hundreds of these. If you get around a group of lamas at the end of their sessions, of 15, 20 minutes, they're making dedication prayer. But I made a short one, it's at the bottom of the refuge sheet. And we're going to chant this in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is how the Dharma is passed to all the cultures of the planet and communicated to the spirit. Ewa di nerdi da, chagya chempo jurgirne, dova chinking maluka, e sa kokarche, sarge kushan nempai jemla da, chogi meger jempai jemla da, kendu niche jumpai jemla ki, chita doma moma jupa shu. By this virtue, I have realized Maha Murti. And we quickly establish all beings without a single exception in that state. For the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three bodies, and the blessing of the unchanging truth of this Dharma, 
by the blessing of the unwavering aspirations and prayers of us the song. May this dedication bear a deep especially for Donald Hill, Marjan, and all sentient beings that are leaving their foreign bodies behind tonight. May they all together have favorable rebirth. May all the long ones have long life, good health, happiness, and prosperity. And may all their wishes be fulfilled. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free of suffering and pain. May all beings establish themselves in bliss through practice and a state of equanimity, emotionally stable. Mr. J. Mr. J. Mahalo. Thank you. Mr. J. Thank you. Thank you.